This is episode two of the Far Out Podcast. Brought to you by Bizarre Guitars, Reno, Nevada. Out of Bounds Brewing Company in Folsom, California. Hi, everybody. I'm Frank Hannon, your host of the Far Out Podcast. It's great to be back. We have liftoff. We have ignition. This is episode two. And I really want to say thanks to all the people who listened to that first episode. Uh, Jesse James Dupree really kicked ass on that interview. He made it real easy because he's very passionate about what he likes to talk about. I got word that over 600 people downloaded that first episode, and I'm very humbled and grateful for all of your support. It's been a crazy couple weeks. I'll tell you, I have been busier than ever. Uh, I've been making a beer a double IPA, the heavy metal hippie double IPA with my friends at Out of Bounds Brewing Company. I put together two shows uh, over the last two Saturdays. One was at a private party. The other one was at the boardwalk. And that show was very intense, man. I had a lot of friends jamming with me, including my special guest for today, Atomic Tommy McClendon. Far out. (laughs) Atomic Tommy is one of my guitar heroes. Going back to the early 1980s, uh, before Tesla, and actually during Tesla's first couple albums, His brother, Dan McClendon, was our stage manager and our our main roadie for years. And even going back before that, when we were City Kid and we were playing the clubs and we were trying to learn how to write songs, Tommy and his brother, Dan, were very instrumental in developing our band and teaching us how to record and write and perform. They were huge inspirations to us. And I personally feel that if it wasn't for them we may not have ever made it. And so I'm very grateful for Dan McClendon and, of course, my special guest, Atomic Tommy McClendon. Tommy's not only a guitarist, but he's an excellent violinist and uh, an all-around musician who sings and plays. Right now, I'm going to play a piece of a song. This is recorded by my band, and this is a song that was written by Atomic Tommy back when he was in a band called Thunderwing back in the late 70s. And City Kid, Earthshaker, we used to cover this song and it was one of our anthems check it out Now that's a badass guitar riff right there, if you ask me. Tommy is my special guest on the show today. He's also going to be joining me in concert at the Boardwalk. Let's get down to the interview right now. I'm Frank Hannon, and you're listening to the Far Out Podcast, and I am very honored to have with me the one and only Atomic Tommy McClendon. What's happening, man? Hey, what's going on? It's been a (laughs) great day and a great evening. We just jammed for an hour, getting ready for the show at the Boardwalk. A lot of people may not know, but we have a long history together. Very long. (laughs) (laughs) Going way back to the early 80s. Yeah, I don't count past 10 years, but yeah, it's more than 10 years. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, Tesla fans and uh, people in the in the business, they may not realize this, but you and your band in the early 80s was a huge influence on Tesla. Um, we used to cover, you know, ACDC, Scorpions, Van Halen, but we used to also cover Thunderwing songs. Yes. I remember <laughs> those days. <laughs> yeah. Was that yeah. strange to have this uh, cover band in Sacramento covering your songs? No, actually, it was a it was a awesome um you know to see like hey what's the sound what do these songs sound like when someone else plays them and listen back it's like hey this song's not too bad (laughs) when you just play it yourself you know you just you hear make a recording of it or whatever and you play it live but when you hear you know like you guys would play some of these songs and it was like wow this is awesome (laughs) you know it was a great feeling 
you know. Well, I wasn't sure because I, I couldn't, you know, I was only 15 years old at the time and I couldn't really play my way out of a paper bag. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope I didn't butcher him too bad. But Modern Age Rock and Trouble and those songs were such great songs. And uh, when did you start writing songs, man? Were you in a cover band first too and then started writing or what did you do? Let's see. When I was 15, 14, 13, going back, uh, I think 14 was uh, the first band I ever played in with my brother. And we and I think I wrote my first song at fourteen, and it was just a, a stupid song, but we actually recorded it. Yeah. Well, that I'm glad you bring up recording because that recording experience that we learned from you and Dan mm -hmm. uh, was really what I feel was crucial to our success in becoming songwriters and learning. Because I don't know if you remember this, but when I was 15, we came down to your studio in your garage in Stockton. And Dan was engineering, and you were there producing and giving us ideas and lessons and tips and stuff. And I asked you, I said, I go, Tommy, what, what can I do to sound better? And you said, listen to yourself. And that was so profound to me. Right? Listening. Right. Listen, listen to yourself. Listen to the other guys. Listen to what you envision in the song as well. You know, what, what's coming around the corner when you're playing something. And I didn't realize when I was recording in your studio, I was playing as fast as I could and trying to play all the licks, but wasn't really listening. And that, that's a whole other art. I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you told me to start listening. You know, you're know, you not listening yeah. to what you're doing. Because when we would go in there and sing was background I, was vocals. Really, really was I like that? <laughs> Well, that brings me to the what a, a teacher you are. So you, you are a music teacher as well, right? Oh, yeah. Violin, guitar, pretty much those two things only. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you were teaching us back then, and I don't even think you realized that you were teaching us, but we were learning from you guys, and I appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> you know, I, I, in those days, I didn't really think of it as teaching. I, it's just like, hey, handing down these little ideas yeah. And, and like inspiration and, and things like that. Talking about Thunderwing and the band we had, how, first of all, how we all met, right? Because of Brian's brother, Brian yeah. Wheat's brother, playing drums with us. And then, then I met, you know, Brian and you. And it's like, hey, these cats in Sacramento, these young cats are really good. They have a great band. We were hungry. <laughs> you were hungry. <laughs> I don't know how good we were, but we were sure hungry. <laughs> but, you had, but you played gigs all the time. We did play gigs and parties and clubs, and um, we, we used to put on our own backyard parties all the time. And uh, um, we were definitely driven and hungry. And your brother, Dan, let's talk about him, man. He was the guy that really was influential to us with recording. I mean, I think the first ever demo tape we ever did was with Dan and yourself in the studio. And so Dan had a passion for recording. Now, who started playing first, you or Dan? Um, really, it was a, both of us, really, at the same time. He played bass and I played guitar. Mm -hmm. And we both played violin when we were kids. And that's how it started musically. Was this in Japan? It started in Japan, yeah, where we were born. Yeah. Wow, so tell us, where, where were you born? Japan. <laughs> no, but what say was it Osaka or no, Tokyo? No, uh, right near Yokohama. Yokohama, Japan. Yeah. And fair. so you started playing violin, and you play violin today, which we're going to talk more about because we're we're going to have you jamming violin in our show. Tell everyone about your experience with the violin. And well, let's see. I started at five years old. The violin was really the instrument that was kind of put in your hands when you were a little kid. You know, your parents buy you, or they get a gift. Uh -huh. I, as a violin, and they, here's your violin. So my brother and I both got violins. It's like, okay, so now we got to take lessons. Uh -huh. So that's how it kind of all started. Well, see, I never knew that when I first started watching you play. I, I didn't realize that you had a foundation with the violin, but I knew there was something unique about your fingering techniques there that was different. So do you feel that the violin gave you a, a, a different sense of music and melody? I think in a lot of ways, yeah. I think it made the, my left hand easier because I'm left-handed. Oh. And even though I never think about right, left, which hand is the prominent, whatever, for playing instruments, but I always like gravitated to the left hand being the stronger hand yeah, for yeah. me. So when picking up the guitar, it was a more a, a straight, natural thing. But the weird thing for me was when I picked up a guitar the very first time, I thought I needed a left-handed guitar. I see. But I like it didn't work. It's like I can't play this left-handed guitar, even though I'm left-handed. 
That's you know? amazing. You know, Tommy Skeel was left-handed and played right-handed guitar. Dave Root is that way, too. And now I'm finding this out about you. That's interesting. A lot of great players that I know are left-handed people but play guitar right-handed. They didn't learn the other way. Yeah. So your left-hand technique is developed from playing violin. I believe so. I mean, just in a natural way. Well, when you play violin, you don't have any frets to rely on. So you really got to develop your ear, which also develops that listening thing you're talking about. Well, yeah, it comes back to that, huh? <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen, listen to yourself. Listen to the music. Yeah, that's it. Listen to the music. Yeah. <laughs> so Thunderwing was was playing around town, and we were young kids, and we really looked up to you guys, and we learned a lot from you guys. And then you were in a band called Boy Wonder. Yeah, we started Boy Wonder being uh, two two other guys. And you had left Boy Wonder, but you were doing some demos in your studio of some songs that I particularly remember, like Fight the Devil and Stranded. Right, those songs, yeah. Yeah. So I was writing songs all the time in that time period, whether it was for the band or just for myself, because, yeah. you know, you never know what's going to happen or where things are going to go if they go. So as I started writing for myself, when I was talking with Mike Varney on the phone, he said, hey, I heard that you played some things on your own and stuff and you have your band why don't you send me some things you mm -hmm. know some music and maybe i can put you in the column in the guitar player magazine I thought hey that'd be really cool i yeah. never thought much that wasn't going to happen or whatever but he called me a few days later after i sent some things to him he said hey i'm going to put you in next month's issue i remember that man i was so excited it was cool to see that <laughs> <laughs> so that was really cool i said okay cool so that happened. Then um, he would call me periodically when he had different folks from other groups looking for players, you know, like he would do for a lot of people. You know, he'd help, help a lot of musicians and guitar players. He said, I got this guy, Phil Mogg, from UFO. Well, UFO just kind of broke up, and he's looking to start a new project. Yeah. So I said, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, what, do you, what should I do? Well, I'm going to have you audition. Yeah. You want to do that? I said, okay, I'd love to do that. Because Phil would come up to the Bay Area, uh -huh. and there was like four or five of us that auditioned. Well, I remember when I met Phil Morgan, and we were so excited for you to join UFO because we were huge UFO fans. And being huge fans of yours, we were just so excited about that. And I was talking to Phil Morgan, and he was like, yes, I love Tommy. He's such a unique player. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was he was right spot on Tommy you know so that's cool so let's go back to Thunderwing man let's talk about Thunderwing and you guys played some local shows here with Jeff Watson band and but you guys also moved up to Seattle yeah yeah that was before we did some of those other gigs we were a three piece at the time and that's when we moved to Seattle and we just kind of wanted to gel as a band because we had an offer you know just kind of live in a basement uh -huh. in a house and um play lots of gigs so let's go do that randy hansen said he saw you on a tv show there and he actually said that he was trying to help them mix sound because he was such a fan of yours do you remember that game? i remember that yeah thank god he was there <laughs> yeah his band called the the yeah t-h-e the <laughs> we would play uh like keggers together in yeah. the seattle area uh -huh. yeah what do you think of technology today and and how it's evolved with everything you mean like in the recording or playing live or... Yeah, recording. It's pretty amazing. Do you miss the old days of like cassette tapes and, and stuff I don't like miss that? cassette tapes. No? No. <laughs> because the, the sound quality. But I do miss the quickness of how you can get ideas down mm -hmm. on a cassette. You know, like those recording things, like the little uh, four track Fostex yeah. or whatever they were. The eight track uh, Tascams. Yeah. Yeah, you could do those really quickly. You know, and you hook up a drum machine. I know what you're talking about with the technology today. Sometimes there's so many cool things you can get that sound amazing, but by the time you get it all hooked up, you've forgotten what you wanted to do. Yes, the learning curve takes too long. Yeah, unfortunately. And you're, you get stuck, and then you have to call somebody, hey, I'm stuck in this uh, thing, I don't know what to do, and then by that time you've lost your idea. Yeah, so you got to, okay, it's going to take me another hour to play this guitar to get that idea back. Yeah. But yeah, you know, outside of that, the sound qualities and things like that are, are great. And the editing power. Yeah, the there. editing power. But sometimes that can kind of get too crazy, too, and you spend more time editing than just jamming and recording stuff. Yeah. Seems like. Yeah, I remember when we would come down to your studio in Stockton, and Dan was recording with the little four-track reel-to-reel, mm -hmm. and then we ended up getting the cassette 
four tracks. But what I loved about it was, is at the end of the project, at the end of the day, you had a cassette you can pass to your friend. Hey, check out my tape. I miss those days. That's true. There was a lot of connection between players, you know, face to face. Face to face, right? Yeah. That's what I was telling our young friend JT in there. He's a, an up and coming guitarist. He's 19 years old and he's kind of in between bands right now. And I was telling him, man, it's going to be up and down, up and down your whole career. You got to get out there and jam with other people. Kind of like how in the old days, like Yorma would hang out with Jerry and they'd go jam at this club one night. And then the next thing you know, they're going in and jamming with Janice. You know, like the stories you hear of the, the days when, when there was more camaraderie, you know? Yeah. It seems like that's missing in, in music. Yeah, even though today with social media and things where um, players can connect with each other from the, the their phones and whatnot... But I think, like you just said, sometimes you don't really know. The text doesn't always tell you a personality. Right. Right. There's nothing that beats jamming. Like, yeah. So we just got done jamming here in the rehearsal room. Isn't it fun when it's just like magic, when everyone's just kind of like passing the ball back and forth? That's true. Yeah, um, the con yeah again, like that connection between players, kind of like um, ESP, like mm -hmm. like reading each other's minds slightly so you can kind of see where, where the music is headed when you're playing something together live. Okay, we're going to take a short break from this interview with Atomic Tommy McClendon. This interview was recorded the night prior to our infamous Boardwalk concert we did last Saturday night. We did a lot of jamming. We had a lot of guitar players on the stage taking turns, trading solos, which is part of that magic that Tommy's talking about. One of my special guest guitarists at that show was Greg Golden from Bizarre Guitar in Reno, Nevada. He will be joining me on the next episode of the Far Out Podcast. Far Out. This episode of the Far Out Podcast was brought to you by Bizarre Guitars in Reno, Nevada. Okay, going along with the theme of the Far Out podcast, this next segment of the interview, Tommy talks about transposing legendary guitar solos into violin solos. Yeah, I used to do a lot of that, you know, decipher guitar solos and just play them on the violin. Yeah. You know, I, I did that live for, for a couple of different bands, and that was, that's always fun. It makes you really listen again to what's going on with the guitar parts. Mm -hmm. You know, and then transfer it to the to another instrument. Yeah, that's that's always a lot of fun to do, because um, you really kind of understand the feel of, of, an, of an instrument and and the song. Mm -hmm. You know, like in a solo or even just like backing parts or whatever. So, being a violinist and a guitarist, what's the difference between a violin and a fiddle? It's spelled differently. <laughs> That's it? That's it. It's not a style difference? No, actually, that's a joke. It is a style. It's completely a style. Uh-huh. A fiddle is like more like bluegrass, kind of happy uh, <laughs> Celtic. Probably yeah. comes from like Irish music. Irish and Scottish and, and Norwegian, Finland and all that, that whole Scandinavian thing as well. Mm -hmm. And the Celtic thing. All mixed up and sent to Canada and the United States back in the 1800s or whenever it was. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah, I love the, the fiddle of that style. I love that music. Um, I don't want to call it that music. Yeah. I love the style of especially um, Nova Scotian fiddling. That's amazing to me. Um, of course, uh, the classic fiddling what I call classic, like bluegrass mm -hmm. and even gypsy jazz from, yeah. from the 1930s and 40s. Yeah. See, that's what's cool, man. I've always loved that about you is you've, you've learned and really paid respects to different styles of music, not just metal or, or uh, lead guitar, but I've noticed recently you've been studying gypsy jazz. Yeah, on the guitar. On the guitar. Yeah, because it's something I skipped before. Right? I never got, a re got into it, and it's like... Wait a minute! I could, I but I need one of those guitars first. Oh, right. So then that's what kind of hey, what now? What is the guitar? Is it different strings or what? What guitar are you talking about? Just the style of the gypsy jazz, the way they're built. Uh huh. You know how um, basically they're not made like a like a dreadnought. They're more a smaller body. That's a big body. Oh, it's a bigger. It depends body. on the the make. 
Is that the guitar that but, Django plays? Yes, the Django style. Yeah. Is there a name for that guitar? The one I use is a, called a Petite Manouche. It's, it deals with the, the sound hole. Okay. And I think the way the, the bodies are built, um, they have a thinner top on them. Ah, so a little snappier tone. So, yeah, the snappier tone, definitely. But they're made to project the sound a little bit differently than a dreadnought. I noticed that there's a real rhythmic snap to the to gypsy yeah, jazz it's like, style. It's almost like it doesn't have a lot of sustain. Mm-hmm. But once you start playing on them, you can't stop, and it makes you play slightly differently than the uh, other styles of music. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the chords and things like that. But even the lead work, whether you're trying to emulate Django Reinhardt or you're just kind of taking those chops and make it your own, you know, there's a few players right now that are doing that, and they're just amazing. I feel that you never stop learning with music. You yeah, get... there's no point in stopping unless you physically can't do something, right? You always want to grow mm-hmm. until the day it comes, <laughs> you know, because that's what music's all about. A long time ago, I think I read something in a magazine, a Rick Derringer interview, uh-huh. and he was talking about music and the general things, and he just said, music is a craft. Mm-hmm. You never stop growing with it. And you can learn sometimes the most simplest thing that you may have overlooked. That I was like, man, I should have learned that years ago. It's just this one note. Wow. You just stumble on one note sometimes. That, right, that, you know? right. And when you first learned it many years ago, like, oh, I'll come back to that. I'll come yeah. back. <laughs> I've been learning that, uh, you know, slowing down is better, you know, because back in the old days, we tried to play as fast as we could, all mm-hmm. as, uh, as fast as you could all the time, you know. It's almost embarrassing to me sometimes when I listen to like some of Tesla's early stuff, you know, where I'm like, oh gosh, why was I playing so fast, <laughs> trying so hard, you know? <laughs> but do you find it's like, it sounds better when you're not trying hard at all? It's usually, it sounds better, huh? Yeah, I think it, I think the, the strong melodies that you're at, trying to create come mm-hmm. out better and they definitely hit home more, mm-hmm. you know? You can still fill things in with fast chops between these ideas of kind of slowing it down and making it more melodic. Yeah. You know, but I think the melody is what people remember anyway, just like a vocal. That brings me to the to the ideas too about guitar players that sing. I was always inspired by Jimi Hendrix, mm-hmm. of course, because that's what he s- sang and played. And so I started listening more and looking for those kind of players. So I was attracted to like guys like Pat Travers and people like that. It's like, oh my God, that's awesome what he's doing. Because it's not easy. Right. And Rick Derringer, we mentioned earlier, right? It's not easy to do. And I think you do get a connection with your music and when you're trying to write something about the strength of the melody. I agree with you, man. Rick Derringer, Joe Walsh. Joe Walsh. Uh, Peter Frampton, Jimi Hendrix. Lots of guys from the 70s, they were doing that. Peter Frampton, especially, you yeah. know, when he went solo from Humble Pie. How right? about Frank Marino? Frank Marino is amazing. Isn't I, he? Yeah. I, I Luckily, I saw him back in Winterland back in the day. And again, he's one of those guys that completely inspired me. Later in my life, when I got an SG, Gibson SG, that's one of the guys I, I would think about in my brain, like, Frank Marino. Yeah, you know. yeah. Did I tell you I got to meet him? I was blown away. I actually was invited to have pizza at his house. <laughs> at, <laughs> at first, I was really nervous. I'm like, oh, I can't believe this. I'm going to actually get to meet and hang out with Frank Marino. But he was the nicest, most down-to-earth, cool guy and really smart. You know, he used to build his own pedals and amps and all that stuff. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first time I ever played an SG was your SG. You let me borrow it one time, and I was hooked on them ever since. <laughs> <laughs> There's something magical about the, uh, the SG when it vibrates or something. Some of them, not all of them are that good. Yeah, like, not all of them. Once in a yeah. while, you come across a good one. So the theme of the Far Out podcast is talking to guys who play guitar but also like to do other things. Now, we've covered mostly music on this little segment here because you're the maestro musician, but what else do you like to do in your spare time, man? I'm just a boring uh, maestro musician. No, <laughs> <laughs> not, these days, not all that much more. Really, it all comes back to something's related to music, whether you know it's teaching or, or just playing, still learning. Learning. Right? And if I play video games, I still love all my video games, new video games that I 
like you said, the multiplayer kind of stuff, right? Yeah, what video games are you into nowadays? My daughter uh, showed me a game called Fortnite where everyone's competing with each other from around the world, and I was just intrigued. I, I mean, I don't play video games, but uh, what video games are you into? Let's see. The ones that waste my time are Fallout 76, um, which is a multiplayer game, um, and... Uh, the do you new... actually put on like eye goggles and, and ear no. muffs? No, no, I don't do that. I'm not that much of a, you don't a have nerd. A, heads, he a yeah. headset? <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> but you, do you com do you have a group of people that you compete with? No, no, just strangers. Oh, okay. And yeah. they come in out of the blue and just like you have to try to not get killed by them or what? Typically, they're not supposed to try to kill you but oh is it a if team they effort? do you like you gotta like you can like block the guy or whatever oh okay because the game i'm talking about my daughter uh jumped out of a helicopter landed on this cabin and started breaking it apart and then out of the blue somebody just shot her from behind or something yeah you don't go breaking apart someone's cabin i mean what do you expect <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah there's other games um Outer Worlds, that's a new one. That's that's cool. That's just a single person player, but it's the first person style, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're violent, but. <laughs> Long way uh, from Pong, huh? <laughs> yeah. Or uh, what's the, the one with the blocks? Yeah. Oh, uh, Tetris. Tetris. Yeah. Tetris or Space Invaders. Remember when that came out? But yeah, but a lot of times I think when there's a cool game, a lot of times there's great music in it. You listen, you start listening to the music, like, holy, what? Yeah. There's some amazing atmospheric music in these things. Mm -hmm. And that's what sometimes it just draws you in, into the game. Yeah. You know, if it has a good story, if it's a single player game and it's got a great story to it, that always intrigues me, makes me want to finish the game, you mm. know. But yeah, again, back to the music. See? Yeah. Yeah, music has been a, a lifesaver for me. Um, I don't know about you, but when we were kids in South Sacramento, uh, we tended to get in a lot of trouble. And so once we started playing guitars in the garage, it kept us from out doing pranks and stuff like that. <laughs> How about Dan? Did Dan get in a lot of trouble when he was young? Because he sure was a troublemaker when he was on tour with us. <laughs> yeah, those stories, aren't there? <laughs> stories. Um, no, he was actually well-behaved because he was a Boy Scout. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about Dan McClendon. Uh, Dan is Tommy's brother, um, uh, was Tommy's brother. He's passed away since then. Uh, rest in peace, Dan. I don't think he's resting in peace. I think he's up there roadying for Jimmy and, and giving God some uh, some headaches up there. Yeah, <laughs> he was bombs. a prankster, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He learned a lot of that from the Tesla tours. I always thought he learned a lot of that from you guys, but... No. No, <laughs> <laughs> no Dan used to uh, set up pyrotechnics and uh, gunpowder bombs at the Oasis Ballroom yeah, when we were Yeah, when it was legal. Course. Yeah. yeah. All right, Tommy, man, it's been great hanging out. Thanks for joining me on the Far Out podcast. You're one far out guy, man. Far Thank out. you. Yeah. Thank you. Far out. This episode of the Far Out podcast was brought to you by Bizarre Guitars in Reno, Nevada. Be sure to tune in next week for episode three with our special guest, Greg Golden. And don't forget the heavy metal hippie double IPA from Out of Bounds Brewing Company. 